Father, thank you, Lord, for the joy of the saints. Thank you for the mystery of the gospel. That a man who was put to death 2,000 years ago on a cross could be the secret that we share now with the world for how to be saved. As improbable as it is, foolishness to those, Father, who don't know the truth. But made so to shame the wise, to give men's wisdom its, its proper indictment. And to show the world that your ways are higher than ours. You've entrusted us, Father, with this mystery, with this solution to the problem of sin. And you gave it to us before we even knew who you were. And there are others like we were, Father, still out there, unfamiliar with you and unaware of the truth, blind to these things. So we sit before you this morning, as we do every week, to be trained up, to be made Christ-like in our thoughts so that we may reflect Him in our actions. We don't learn these things, Father, for our own sake, for we are saved and have been already. Though we desire to live a holy life, and these words will help us endeavor to do that. But, Father, they are life to others as well. Let us be the one who would bring that life, the messenger who brings the good news. And so I pray that what we see today in Abraham and, and in Isaac and the lives of these people are going to be things that will come to bear in our hearts about issues we face every day. As only the Spirit can do, Father, I pray that it would become a source of conviction and guidance and encouragement and uh, power that would cause us to walk in your ways. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're almost halfway through the book of Genesis. And if you think about how much we've studied so far, you could boil it down to basically two storylines. The establishment of creation, followed by the establishment of Abraham the man, the patriarch who began the line. And we've gone through half the book, and that's basically what we've covered. We're not quite halfway there. I guess I'm rounding up a little, but... We're almost, and as we move into the second part of the book in weeks to come, we'll move through just two more patriarchs, essentially. And of course, there's also Joseph, who extends out of the line of Jacob. But it's in the line, it's in the seed, it's in the promise, it's in how these men are moved forward from a place in the beginning where they do not know God to a point later in their life where they can reflect into the world. And by their obedience, God is moving in the lives of people. It's the central story of, of Genesis. When we looked at Abraham last week, and as we noted his life was drawing to a close, we mentioned there were two matters of unfinished business in his life, which the Scriptures wanted to address in the last couple of chapters of his life. One was Abraham needed a resting place, a burial place for himself and for his wife. This was a culturally important issue, but it also had biblical significance because a man who was called to a new place like Canaan and told to remain there because it would be his eventual inheritance, that man needs to be as careful about where he spends his days in the grave as he did in how he spent his life on earth. And Abraham understands this, and he said, I need a place that will reflect my faith in God's promises. And he insisted that he find somewhere to stay in the land. That was the first issue. We looked at that last week. The second issue that he needed to address before he dies is securing a wife for his son Isaac. Having bought the cave in Machpelah for his wife, now he turns his attention to that second issue. It's been three years since Sarah's death at the point of chapter 24. Abraham now is 140. And he knows that, though he isn't sure of exactly the date of his death, of course, it's not going to be all that much longer. And in that case, he has a sense of urgency about finding Isaac, his wife. Remember last week we said he was determined to remain planted in the land because that's where God placed him. He was so determined to stay there that he actually worked against the culture and against the tradition of the day in not going back to his ancestral homelands in Ur to be buried there with his family. Instead, he stayed in Canaan. This is counterculture, counter expectation. The world would have said that Canaan was not Abraham's land. The world would have said, your land is back in Ur. But Abraham lived by a faith that understood, no, this is my land. Even if we don't see it yet, one day in eternity, God has said it will be mine. And he wanted to reflect that by being buried there. Now, how is he going to approach the problem of finding a daughter-in-law? In the same way, counterculture, walking by faith, not by what the world would say is proper. Because in the world that Abraham lived in, he would have been expected to intermarry with Canaanites. After all, 
If this is the land he is choosing, if this is the home he now establishes for himself, then he needs to do all that he can to advance his own purposes, his own security in this land. And the fastest way to do that is to intermarry with those of leadership in the land. And through those intermarriages, new tribes are formed and his family would have been secure in that place. Instead, what's he going to do? He's going to live by faith. And the faith that he has by God's power tells him that though the land of Canaan will one day be his, the people that are currently occupying the land are not its rightful occupants. Not for eternity. The Canaanites and the people that now occupy the land are not God's people. So he's lived as a nomad. He's never permitted anyone to claim that they made Abraham rich. He has distanced himself from the people while remaining in the land. And he has no business uniting himself and his family with those people. He's not going to have a woman taken from the Canaanites for his son to be a part of his family. So let's understand how he stays in the land, but he finds a bride from outside the land for Isaac. There is a beautiful story embedded into the events of chapter 24. It's not the story on the page, but it's a picture, a shadow that's formed out of these events. And it tells us a beautiful and important story of Christ himself. It develops slowly throughout the story. In fact, today we won't really touch on it at all. I would encourage you, perhaps in your own scholarship, to see if you can start to find it for yourself. And if so, I think you'll be rewarded for the effort. But in coming weeks, as we finish the chapter and move on, I'll examine it with you. Keeping in mind, this is not only a picture of Christ, it's also a picture of us. You and I personally are represented in the story of Genesis 24. Again, I'll show you that as we move through. Let's go to the chapter, though, chapter 24, verse 1, and begin reading in the story of how Abraham finds a wife for his son. Verse 1, now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Well, suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land where you came from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying to your descendants, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this, my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Well, Moses says here as we begin that Abraham is advanced in years and God has blessed him in every way. Well, we could go a whole Sunday enumerating the ways God has blessed Abraham. We won't do that, of course, but even in passing, it's easy to list them. He has a long life. He's got earthly wealth. He has a loving wife or did most of his life. He has his promised son now, and he has continuing freedom to sojourn in all these lands that are technically not his, at least not in this day. Isn't that interesting? He has all these things and no worries. He's living literally as if he were the only one in the land. Where he wants to go, he goes. Where he wants to have his animals graze, they graze. No one bothers him. I mean, from the world's perspective, he's just wandering in their land. But from his own personal perspective, he's the king of the land. God's blessings are already evident in his life, even if there's still more to come in eternity. Because reality is these are the least of what he has, the least. In a future day, in the resurrection of the saints, when we will all be there with him in the kingdom, he's going to receive an internal inheritance. Can you imagine what God has reserved for the man he calls his friend? He will presumably have the biggest, best house in the kingdom. To put it in simple terms, we don't know exactly what it will mean, but... What he has now in this earthly day pales in comparison to what he will have in that eternal time. But in this way, God has blessed Abraham in every possible way, then and in the future, in all his needs and in all his desires and joys. Every believer can honestly say they 
have a measure of the same experience in our own lives. We all receive some measure of blessing now with the hopeful expectation of greater rewards in eternity, depending on our service to God, our faithfulness and his grace. To some degree, our blessings will follow our obedience, but we have no guarantees this side of heaven. We can be led to think that our lifestyle or our beliefs and our actions now have a direct relationship on what God does for us now, such that if I'm living a happy-go-lucky life with all the physical blessings and material wants met, then that must mean I'm doing everything God wants me to do. And if Joe or Sally is having a life of difficulties and trials and frustrations and they're out of work or they're having sicknesses or so on and so forth, then they just must not be pleasing God. That kind of quid pro quo, that direct consequential relationship, that is a source of legalism. It is a biblically ignorant view of life. It denies that God has sovereign control and decision-making power over all of those facets of our life. It turns them into a genie and it suggests that we can directly trace our circumstances to God's happiness. That's a lie. Sometimes God takes the people who please him the most and makes martyrs out of them, on crosses no less. And then there are people who God leaves to make disobedient choices and to live a lavish and selfish lifestyle all the way until their death so that they can feel the full measure of consequence in eternity. It's all within his purview to do those things. We cannot fool ourselves to think that because our life is either good or bad relative to some earthly standard, that that's a fair measure of God's perspective. Where do we go to know God's perspective? Where can we find out whether or not we're pleasing him? His word. By the statutes and standards and guidelines that he's provided in his word and by the spirit's conviction concerning those things. We don't need to base our judgment on simple earthly criteria that in the long run have very little to say about whether we're pleasing God or not. Abraham was fully blessed, we're told, in every possible way as a measure of God's pleasure in him. But those things didn't change reality for him. He he suffered in various ways. He saw things happen to him that were not pleasant. He wasn't always living the high life. But God ensured that his testimony, as it's seen overall, reflects God's pleasure in his life. Paul wrote in Romans 8.18, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Even Paul himself understood suffering, and Paul himself knew that was not the criteria for God's pleasure. It will be only at the judgment seat of Christ that we'll fully understand whether or not we serve the Master properly. So then it came time for Abraham to seek a bride, and we saw the scene as it opens up here. Abraham preparing a servant, one of his servants, to go find a bride for his wife. Why is he using a servant? Well, it was not uncommon for a man to use a servant to find a wife for his son. But in light of how important this son is, and in light of how important it was to Abraham to get the right kind of wife, it does beg the question, why is he willing to use a third party to do this? Why doesn't he go himself and find the right wife? And the answer is because he has a dilemma. He's in the land. Abraham is in the land. And he is not going to leave the land. The wife for Isaac is not in the land. Someone's going to have to leave to go get the wife. If it's not going to be Abraham, then he has to send someone else. The problem is, if he were to leave the land, he would feel disobedient to God's call to remain. But if he were to find a woman from where he himself could search for one, then he would be equally disobedient for having found the wrong kind of wife. That's Abraham's dilemma. So he selects a servant to act as his proxy to find this wife. And he says two things to this man. He says, you must find a wife from my household and you must not take my son out of the land. One of Abraham's worries under this circumstance or under this scenario is that this servant is going to get a little lazy. And somewhere along the lines, after walking a long distance and perhaps finding a little success, he would not want to come back empty handed. And as a result, might be tempted to grab one of the local gals anyway, lie in a sense, and just call her one of his relatives. That's not to indict the servant. We don't even know his name. But Abraham is so concerned about that possibility that he causes this servant to engage in this very important ritual, this very important tradition. He is told to place his hand under Abraham's thigh. That's what it says in my text. Now, the Hebrew word for thigh here is actually far more personal. 
It could be translated loin, which is as far as I'm going to go with this this morning. Let's just say the servant is asked to swear while holding something very dear to Abraham as a sign that if the servant failed in this regard, Abraham's descendants could exact revenge upon the servant. And so the symbolism of this is to reflect that it will be my future generations, my seed, that will eventually bring revenge, if necessary, to this charge that I'm giving you. So that the servant understood that he was not going to be free from this consequence, even if Abraham were to die. This is traditional, not today, but it is traditional in this day that a man would ask another man to do this sort of thing, to make this sort of oath. Very sacred, obviously. But when it was done, it left an absolutely certain impression on the minds of those who participated about what they were saying and why this was so solemn. And as a result, the instructions now are strict. The servant will go to his death, literally, to avoid breaking this promise. He is going to find Isaac a wife from Abraham's relatives, bring that wife back to Canaan. And then he asks the logical question, because if he's going to make this oath, he knows what's on the line. You don't do this lightly. He's worried about what if I can't? I mean, after all, how are we to compel anyone to do something like this? He says, what if the woman doesn't want to return? Am I never to come home unless I can come home with a wife? And then he offered, well, maybe I just take Isaac there instead. And of course, Abraham answered sternly, no, Isaac's never to go to Canaan. He's to stay in the land. And then he repeats the promises that God has given to him. I love this about Abraham. He says, I've been told by the God of heaven and earth that my descendants will inherit this land. And therefore, he says, I'm determined to see my son remain in this land so that he will, in fact, receive those promises of inheritance. It's interesting to note of the first three patriarchs, only Isaac never leaves the land in his entire lifetime. So he himself, Isaac, will be born, live and die in the land. And so this is Abraham's concern not to see this testimony of faith broken. But then he responds one step further. He says, if the God who appeared to me said, my descendants will inherit this land, then he says, I know he will go before you and ensure you will find a woman who wants to come back here. Isn't this an amazing statement of faith? What he's saying is, God gave me an oath. That's the oath we studied back in chapter 22. Now we see why it's so important. It's having that intended effect in Abraham's life. The reality of that oath is affecting Abraham's life. Just as Hebrews said when we studied this last time we looked at it, when Hebrews said that we have reason by virtue of this oath to take hold of the hope that is set before us. The hope that was set before Abraham was you and your descendants will have this land. The oath was all Abraham needed to know that God would keep his word. And based on that oath, Abraham now is acting in a way that is consistent with his faith. He says, if God promised such a thing, then we can be sure he's going to give you a woman who wants to come back. It's just that simple. He's not going to promise something and then set up circumstances so that it's impossible for him to keep his own promise. It's self-evident. So he says in verse 7, if God's promised this thing, then I can be sure of it. You're going to find the right bride. And he does give the servant an out. He says, if in fact you find no one, then you can come back without one. But don't take my son there. This is such a beautiful picture, though, of living by faith. Look at this progression. It begins with an understanding of God's promises. If you don't understand what God's promises mean to us in the faith we have in Christ, then you have no starting point from which to live a life that's based on faith. You've got to understand what are these promises we've been given in Christ. Then he moves from that to a faith that God will keep his word. We understand what he said, and then we add to that confidence or faith that he will keep his word. Then that... Combination brings a change in our thinking and our behavior. The Abraham of Ur, the Abraham of the pagan life that he lived with his father Terah in Ur, that Abraham would not have made this decision. This is a different decision than the one he would have made naturally. This is one informed by his understanding of God's promises and built on a faith that God is true to his word. And with that, his thinking has changed, his priorities have changed, his behavior now is changing. Ultimately, what did it produce in him? A confidence that as he walked according to God's promises, that he would know and expect God himself would be going before him, clearing the path of obstacles and making all things work to good for his people according to that plan. Isn't that an amazing way to think about life? I know he's promised that my son will inherit this land. I know I have to have a wife to get descendants. He's promised that as well. 
So I know if you go to a faraway place looking for a woman you don't even know in a family you've never met, you'll find one willing to travel 500 miles back here and marry my son. How can I know that? Because I trust God at his word. And I'm going to make decisions with a confidence that all of this will work out. Is that wishful thinking? Is that positive thinking, the power of positive? No, it's faith in action. That's all it is. What we often do is we run all the way up to that last point. We have an understanding. We have a faith. We know God is good and keeps his promises. And we stop because it's crazy. Well, yeah, it's crazy in our old way of thinking, but it makes perfect sense if we have the faith we claim to have. It's just that simple. We believe God goes before us. Not to make all things perfect for our sake, just to make things good for his plan. And so Abraham can send a servant to the other side of the world in his day to find a wife for his son with complete confidence. Because after all, it's obvious God has to do this if it's going to work. That's faith in action. Look at the next passage, starting in verse 10. The servant swears, and then he goes out. Verse 10, the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink. And who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. So as the servant departs, this is just a beautiful scene. As the servant departs for Ur, he leaves with this huge entourage. Well, huge, substantial, let's put it that way. He has 10 camels and then he carries a variety of goods from Abraham's household. So it is truly like a train and these are boxcars of the day and he's leaving town with all of this with him. Collectively, what he's taking is the price that will be paid for the bride. In traditional terms, weddings were really a negotiation between two families which involved surrogates for the respective participants. So there was a surrogate or a representative for the bride. There was one for the groom. These families were really being united through this marriage, and so the deal had to be done in an appropriate way. They saw marriage very differently than the way we do. We see it as boy meets girl, boy falls for girl, and the romantic thing kicks in, and then love will find a way, and they go forward with the marriage anyway. In the day that marriage was done here, the process and the thinking was completely different. Honey, we don't really care if you love him or not. You'll learn to love him. You'll learn to take care of him. And in fact, it's probably better that you don't love him because if it's only based on emotion, that can go away in a heartbeat. And then where will you be? Better that it be based on solid ground, which is family negotiation, contracts, things you don't break as easily. The love thing, that'll come. This is a little bit of cynicism there to it, but there's also a lot of wisdom in it. And although I certainly don't say go out and arrange marriages, you could if you wanted to as far as I'm concerned. We've done that for our daughter. She's not listening, but we have the guy picked out. Of course, he's not listening either, so this is really hard. We're 0 for 2, but we're working on it. So this is the nature of marriage in the day. So he's carrying the bride's price with him, expecting that when he does find the woman that God has appointed, he will have to then enter into a negotiation. This is a part of how he will win the bride. It represents a small fraction of Abraham's wealth, But it is still a significant gift to whomever receives it. And because it is a fraction, it's impressive. It will cause the family who has the bride to see that they're sending their daughter into a family of means, which is important. I mean, think of it from their point of view. They're giving their daughter up to another family. They don't want to send her away into a bad situation. This would show to that family that they can respect the man that's taking their daughter, that they have a reason to believe it will be a good family to be a part of. It's also interesting that there are ten camels. It's a number that is used in Scripture to reflect testimony, a witness, a testimony. In this case, it's a testimony of Abraham, of his wealth, his generosity, and of his sincere desire to find a daughter-in-law. Notice where he goes. The servant takes these ten camels. He goes to Mesopotamia. That's Ur, or present-day Babylon, or Iraq, actually, today. This is the place where Abraham originated from. In the east, 
Now, to get there, he would not have gone straight in cardinal direction terms. He wouldn't have gone just straight east. That would have sent him across the worst of the desert in Arabia. He would have followed the, the Fertile Crescent, which was the way Abraham himself traveled when he came over from her. So it's like an upside down U. He goes around from where they are in the Promised Land through Haran, up around the Fertile Crescent, following the, the Euphrates River back down into Mesopotamia. That trip is about 500 miles one way. So he's walking 500 miles, only to turn around and walk back 500 miles, of course, when he gets the bride. You also notice the directions here. He's going from the west to the east to find someone who will then travel from the east to the west. Some of the earlier conversations where we talked about east versus west in Scripture and the significance of that. We'll come back to that, actually, as we look at the picture that's being formed here. He eventually reaches the city of Nahor, we're told. Now, that's not the name of the city. It's a description of this is the town in which Nahor lives. Remember Nahor, Abraham's brother? This is the family that we last heard about just a couple chapters ago at the end of chapter 22 when Abraham learned that his brother Nahor had had children and that even one of them had now had grandchildren for Nahor. That grandchild was Rebekah. So back in chapter 22, we had a little foreshadowing of this experience here. Now let's put ourselves in the servant's place with the task he's been given. He would have known that he was going to this region and he would have probably known the name of the town in which Nahor lived because that probably came with the news that Abraham received concerning his relatives. So Abraham gave the servant that much knowledge up front. I know my brother's living in such and such a place. His name is Nahor. Look for the family of Nahor in that place. He may have even told him, I know that Nahor has a granddaughter. He may have other daughters. That's where you need to go. That's where my family lives. But he would have had very little else to go on. There was no Polaroid pictures, no Internet, no Facebook page. He had no way to know who he was looking for when he gets there, what their family would be like, where they've lived in that region. He's going to be very much at the mercy of the locals. And in the earthly sense, you would say luck, but we know better. In the spiritual view of life, we say he's at God's mercy. God's got to direct him to the right person. And he's walking with that expectation. And you can see that in how he approaches the problem when he reaches the town. He gets to the well, which is on the outskirts of the city. Wells were strategic resources. Having a well nearby was the difference between life and death. So people's lives centered around where the wells were. And women in this culture had the duty of drawing water. Men had other duties. This is one of the women's duties. They would often go several times a day to draw water for the home. But at least once in the evening they would go. So evening time at the well was the most common place you would find women. So if you were a man looking for companionship, where would you go to find women? The well. By the way, three notable Old Testament figures found their wives by going to the well. Not only did Isaac, but so did Jacob and so did Moses. And in the New Testament, of course, Jesus has several interesting encounters with women at wells. So this is a, a place you go if you want to meet women or talk to them. But there was a protocol. Strange men did not approach strange women. Men didn't talk to women at all, for the most part, unless they were married or had family relationships, because that would have been considered inappropriate, especially if the woman was unmarried. It was just not done. So the servant now is at the position of needing water for himself, needing water for his camels, but he sees this as a way in which he can kill two birds with one stone. He's not only going to get water, but he's going to have an opportunity to see if God is at work in this moment, providing a wife, providing an answer for the question, who will be Isaac's wife? So he stands at the well, watching women come to the well and leave. There's a continual parade of women. And now the question is, how do I know which one to select? I mean, if you say, hey, I've got ten camels, big rich dad back home, looking for a wife, any of you women interested? The problem could almost be the opposite. Too many women who would be interested, not to say that it was an easy task, but the point is, how do you know you've got the one? Just the right one. The one God has picked out, in other words. The servant prays to the Lord for specific direction, and he asks two things. He says, I want you to show your loving kindness, not to me, but to Abraham, and do that through a work in me that arrives at the right person. And he devises a simple but certain test. He asks God to bring about a very peculiar circumstance. The woman who is to marry Isaac would be the kind of woman who was not only gracious enough to let him have water out of her cistern as she draws water, but she would voluntarily take the next step and offer 
to water all his camels as well. Now, just being willing to talk to the man and let him drink from her cistern would have been remarkable all by itself. Most women under that circumstance would have been very put off by a man intruding into their private space and saying, may I have some of your water? In today's world, if we wanted to draw a comparison, it might be like you're sitting at a stoplight and somebody opens the back door of your car and sits in the back seat and says, can you drive me somewhere? What, what are you doing in my car, right? You would be worried, in fact. Similarly, that's the way the woman would have felt for him coming and making this request. But what if you said to the man in the back seat, not only will I drive you somewhere, but when we're done, you can keep my car. That's what he's asked for, in a way. It's a different situation, of course. But he's asking for that kind of remarkable response as a test to assure him that this is the woman God has. The Bible records tests of this kind in numerous places in Scripture. And I think Christians can often be confused over if and when tests like this could be appropriate for us. For example, Moses taught the Israelites in the desert in Deuteronomy 6.16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. So we see verses like that and we think, well, maybe we aren't allowed to test God at all. And then we ask, is this servant doing the right thing? when he presumes to put this test before God? Well, the answer is there's actually two different kinds of tests in Scripture, two different kinds of ways in which this word is being used. There are times when we test God's patience. We are knowingly disobedient. We continue in sin, almost daring God to take action to stop us. That's testing God's patience. Parents feel this all the time, kids that test our patience. They know the right thing. They're not doing the right thing. So they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing to see if we will. That's testing. If we dare to test the Lord too often in that way, he will eventually bring discipline. That's what Scripture promises. And that is the kind of test that Scripture prohibits because, in a sense, it's just another word for sin. But then there's another use of the word test in Scripture. There are times when we ask God for a test so that we may discern his will. That's an entirely different meaning of the word test. And that's where I think some of the confusion arises. Gideon is well known in Scripture for seeking a sign of this nature, one in which he could test God's will. And that's what the servant is doing here. He's put out a test before God so that he can understand God's will. This second type is done in faith, where the one in the beginning, the first one is done out of a heart of sin. This is one done out of a heart of faith that wants to obey. It just simply doesn't know for sure what to do in order to obey. God delights to answer the question of an obedient heart that is simply unsure of which path to take. God has no problem with that question, and he answers it. Now, there's nothing wrong, then, in using that second kind of test to discern God's will. And when we are given direction from the Lord and we sense him communicating to us, either through prayer or our circumstances or his word, we may lack clarity a little bit along the path. We may have a general idea, but we lack some details. In those circumstances, it is perfectly appropriate to construct a test of this nature to discern God's will. As infrequently as we see it happening, nevertheless, it is valid. If we're to apply it, though, there are some guidelines. First, we only should request a test from God when we're considering matters that God has already placed before us. So there's some direction some mandate and we're just not clear on the details so we want clarity on that thing that he has already given us god is not a genie we cannot conjure him up on our own whim we can't say you know what god if this happens then i'll know to pick these numbers for the lottery or some crazy thing like that you cannot ask god to communicate on your terms so we're only talking now about issues in which he has already stepped into our life and communicated we have clarity that he is asking something we just don't have enough clarity to know how to respond Then we can put a test before him and say, clear this up for me, please. If you hear God telling you, for example, to sell all your possessions and go to the other side of the world and be a missionary, you might want to put a test before him to make sure that you're not hearing him wrong because there's a lot at risk and you want to be doing the right thing. So here you have that kind of situation. A servant engaged in a matter that's already been spelled out for him. He trusts it's coming to him by God through Abraham and he is working in that will. But he is unclear about how to succeed. So he puts a question out there regarding that task. The second thing is the test needs to be specific and unmistakable. Specific and unmistakable. 
It's not a game. You need to be very clear with your own heart. This is what God's asked me to do. I need to know to discern something very specific about it. God, I'm going to create a sign, unmistakable and so specific, that if it turns out this way, I'll have no choice but to see it as your will. The servant does that here, right? He asks this woman to do something that's about as improbable as you could come up with. Gideon, by the way, did something very similar with the fleece. He spells out a a test that is supernatural, but it's just close enough to natural that he wasn't clear if maybe he got it wrong, so then he reversed them the next day. Well, that was his way of getting it to be unmistakable, to be so specific he couldn't mistake it. Then the final thing I would argue we should be doing. We have to construct these in such a way that they lead us to the clarity we seek. Sometimes we ask questions that even if I give you the answer, it's still not enough. It's still not everything we need. In other words, it'll leave us with a new question rather than actually cutting to the core of the issue. I'm not creating rules for God. He can speak any way he chooses, of course. But I think in the way we might construct the test, we might fool ourselves or feel like God didn't answer when the real issue was we didn't bring the right heart, the right question, or enough clarity for us to be able to discern what he says in response. How did the servant provide for that clarity in his own request? Well, we've already said it was an improbable outcome with this woman. Think, though, about how improbable it really was. A thirsty camel in this day and age would drink, on average, about 25 gallons of water. He's got 10 camels. That's 250 gallons of water. Your average cistern might hold four or five gallons. There's the effort required to raise the water up out of the well, to fill the cistern, to carry the cistern, to water the camel, walk back, do that how many times for 250 gallons? Do the math. And why? Not because anyone told her to do it. Not even because anybody asked her to do it. She would voluntarily make this up and decide, hey, you know what? I see some thirsty camels. Why don't I just take on this two and a half hour task for you? The nature of his request precluded any chance that he would misinterpret the outcome. If this happens, it's got to be God. So now I ask, if this is the way tests can be constructed, if we have the option at times to gain this kind of clarity... Why don't Christians take this approach more often? I dare ask if anyone in here has ever done it, and maybe some have, but I'm pretty sure the minority have, if if anyone. Asking the Lord for a test to discern his will is a biblically legitimate way to get clarity in following God. And yet, most Christians never try it. Could it be we just don't want to hear the answer? God speaks in a lot of ways. He speaks in prayer, and he speaks through counselors, and he speaks through his word, of course, and circumstances. But the problem is we're just such poor listeners, and maybe more than that, we're really not interested in the answer half the time, if we're honest with ourselves, because it's easy to ask a question, even from God. It's hard to accept the answer when it comes. Gideon, for example, asked God to confirm whether he should go into battle with 300 fairly poor warriors against a huge opposing force who were trying to defeat Israel. And when he asked, he got his answer, and then he had to ask again and kind of double-check the answer. In the end, he obeyed. But I wonder if the reason he asked the second time was partly because he didn't like the answer. The answer was yes, go. And similarly, I think if we are determined to find God's heart in the matter and we ask him and we propose a test even, the tendency when we get the answer back is to do what? To say, well, maybe that wasn't God after all. Maybe it's just coincidence. I mean, after all, maybe she just wanted to water ten camels. Maybe she's just a camel lover. You see how we can do that? We can talk off the answer as if it's not really God because we don't really want to have to walk in faith. It's actually a challenge. Next week when we come back, we're going to see if the servant finds a woman willing to do this thing and how he responds when he finds it. And we'll also start to break down this picture of Christ. As I said, I wouldn't do that this week. Next week we'll start to do that. I'm hoping you're already starting to see some some imagery, some patterns that remind you of our relationship with the Lord and how the Lord himself is at work in the world. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, that you can speak to us in so many ways. Thank you that you are determined to reveal your will to us. We can see this so much in the way that you have painstakingly put your word together over the centuries and delivered it to us in the way that you have. No God who makes that much effort to speak out and be heard is a God who will remain silent in the face of an obedient heart that just asks a question. So give us, Father, both the faith to ask and the faith to hear and the faith to respond. Give us the trust that comes from knowing who you are, 
And then I ask, Father, when we get those answers and when we are faced now with decisions, that we would walk as Abraham did, confident that you will be ahead of us, going before us and working out details, that even if we don't know the next step, we can trust that you're there before we are. That's how faith lives, Father. I pray that we would be that kind of church in our individual lives and corporately as we work together. I know that we can be powerful in your will. We have that hope, Father, to be in your will. Let your word keep us there. And bring us back, as always, each week, with others as well, if that be your will, so that we may continue to grow, always to the purpose of glorifying your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.